But today it's my privilege to welcome uh, Robert and Tuli. Uh, I met Robert through Pabalo, who ran that uh, along with a few others, but pubs ran this uh, event on racism and injustice and, and our response to that as a, as a, as a people. And Robert's up at, uh, at uh, sorry, uh, Pubs is up at uh, following, following Jesus, and he, he managed this whole thing, brought them all together. It was a really stimulating time, and, and they're developing more and more exposure to our, uh, for us to be challenged about these things and to engage with transformation. And so Pubs introduced me to Robert, and I've had some lovely conversations with Robert. Uh, he's married to Zamo, and I see zamo has been blessing us for the worship today already on the Facebook. Thanks, Zamo. And... Uh, Two children, Malusi and Kanyiso. Great to, to begin to meet you guys as a family. Robert uh, pastors a church called Living Stones Agency, LSA, in Durban. And um, we've asked him to come and speak with us and share what God's put in his heart for the vineyard in South Africa. So, Robert, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, great to be with, uh, with the Vineyard uh, family this morning. And um, yeah, Dave and I met. It's strange what God is doing inside of COVID-19 and the lockdown. Um, you know, we actually met during that uh, racism uh, conversation or seminar. It was during this time of this lockdown. And I feel like there's been, even though our lives have been locked up, uh, there has been a, a lot of fruitfulness that God has been doing in terms of connecting people and, and, and some amazing kingdom stuff that, is a, that has been happening. And as a result of which uh, I'm speaking to you this morning. So um, I'm really, really excited to be with you, uh, Vineyard uh, family. And thanks, uh, thanks to Dave and, and Colleen for this invitation. And, um, and I do want to greet the other leaders uh, of Vineyard Movement and those other leaders who are joining us this morning, and of course, the entire family of uh, the Vineyard uh, Movement in South Africa. I'm gonna, um, just before we kick off, I'm just, I would like to share screen with you so that we can um, uh, just share, you know, you can check with me in terms of uh, what we're gonna be going through here. Uh, let me just get that out of the way, and then we're gonna be good to go. Okay, here we go. I hope that I'm good uh, from the, you know, tech team, the tech team will help, will help if uh, there's some, if there's any issues, but uh, it all seems like I'm good on my side um, and that my screen should be shared with you. Okay, so um, really, again, thanks, uh, Dave and Colin, for the invite uh, this morning. And um, I've, I've thought hard and reflected and contemplated with the Lord just about what I wanted to share, what I needed to share this morning. I really want to speak about kingdom transformation, kingdom transformation in the new season. There is no doubt that David was just talking about um, uh, the whole issue of reset uh, just now. There's no doubt that we're in some form of transition from one season to another, from one era to another. Uh, the world in post-COVID-19 world is going to be very, very different. We have to process what that looks like. And so I wanted to talk to you, Vineyard family, about kingdom transformation in the new season that we find out, that we're going to be finding ourselves, and that is emerging before us. And as we kick that off, um, I, I want to kick that off by the question that the Lord asked the prophet, Jeremiah. Uh, in a critical time, he asked the prophet, what do you see, Jeremiah? And this conversation goes on between the prophet and God. And, um, and uh, on the basis of Jeremiah's sight of what was happening upon the nation, 
uh, God would then almost like unfold or re reveal more information. And so it almost like as though Jeremiah's correct you know, answers to the questions from God uh, were critical for God to unveil more of his mind and more of his heart. And I, I believe that God is asking us the same question as church, as the Vineyard movement, as the church, as the body of Christ, God is asking us the same question. What are we seeing post COVID-19? Are we seeing what do we see and just like jeremiah we also have to answer god and give god some answers so that he can unveil more of his heart and mind to us and bring us to a place of partnership um i believe that we are not just called to manage scientific data you know data uh jesus jesus rebuked the pharisees in Matthew chapter 16 about just being able to interpret uh, the rising of the sun and to interpret the seasons from, a, from an astronomical scientific point of view. Uh, I'm not here um, devaluing science. Science is important, but actually God has stationed the World Health Organization, uh, some scientists to track COVID-19. Scientists who will also be part of or within the ranks of the church actually as well. Uh, God has economists to track, uh, economists to track, you know, e economic implications of this pandemic. This pandemic is very systemic in the sense that we're not just dealing with public health, we're dealing with economic issues, we're dealing with a whole variety of issues. So when you say COVID-19, you're dealing with a, a, a complex of issues, a collection of issues, a systemic pandemic in a true sense of the word. But actually we have different bodies and institutions tracking different things. And so the words of Jesus to the Pharisees that you, you are not just, you know, you know, astronomers or, 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 or climate scientists who are reading, you know, the movement of the stars, but actually the church at the time or those, the people of God at the time, just as the church today, uh, is called to analyze the conditions in order to see kingdom developments in the world. The thing that we have to see is kingdom developments. What how are the conditions that are taking place currently you know creating an opportunity for the kingdom of god or laying a platform for the gospel of the lord jesus christ that's a question that we we have to ask ourselves and that's a question that we have to answer and so this is so very very crucial um covid 19 has broken out since december 2019 in china we know this and it's been moving across continents and we have to ask ourselves a question. For the past nine months, are we dealing with a situation where God has been struggling to answer our prayers? Or is God, in fact, facilitating kingdom development in the midst of the disaster? So we can either hold a view that here we are and we've been praying for the last nine months and God has been trying to answer us and he hasn't quite you know, been able to, or we can say that there's actually something that God is doing in the midst of the unfortunate circumstances of the earth. I, I, I doubt that we worship a God who is on the other side of the line trying to fight with the devil as the devil is causing havoc in the earth. I think God is in full control. He is sovereign. He is all powerful. And so if something this, you know, uh, uh, my, this, 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 if something this big has been happening in this, in the earth, for the, night, for the last nine months or so, then there has to be something in the midst of the crisis that gives us some clues about what God is actually up to in the earth. I like the scripture in, I like the whole book of Habakkuk. I think uh, uh, um, Dave was just talking about scenarios that we can look, parables we can look at in the Bible, in the word of God, to, to, to make sense of what's happening around us. Uh, he used the story of Joshua. But I also love the, the book of Habakkuk, because Habakkuk is processing and wrestling with evil and crisis all around him, and he's trying to understand where God, where is God. And when you read the entire book, it's not a long book, uh, it's got just three chapters, but actually full of content and full of wisdom, you see this prophet who moves from uh, a complaining prophet to a prophet in chapter three who begins to worship God because he sees that God is in the midst of it all. So the prophet Habakkuk sees the Lord moving across the earth 
and the Lord is bracketed by plague and pestilence in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. Um, in, in verse 4 and 5, he says, His splendor, the splendor of God, was like the sunrise, raised flesh from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. Amazing, amazing scripture um, uh, uh, that talks about the nature of God's movement that we can, that helps us to, put, to give us some clues about how we process our own pandemic inside of this time. So Habakkuk sees, the, uh, sees uh, the, this, you know, in his day, he sees the Lord's movement bringing deliverance. He says in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 13 uh, that you came out to deliver your people. So actually this day of crisis, this day of global disaster was nothing but uh, uh, the, the, the hand of the Lord moving across the nations of the earth to bring deliverance. And that sight by Habakkuk empowers him, empowers the prophet to rejoice in the Lord. We know the scripture in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. He begins to rejoice in the Lord, though the fields produce no food and though there is there are no sheep in the pen. Very, very similar to where we find ourselves. We started with COVID-19, which was a public health crisis. It landed us in an economic crisis and it landing us in all sorts of other crises like gender-based violence and inequality and all of those things. And the prophet begins to rejoice because he sees something in the midst of the crisis. He sees God. The prophet acknowledges the crisis, but he also, and he, saw, he sees that the crisis is bringing personal economic challenge to him, but he is edified by the sight of the bigger picture. I believe that where we are and where we find ourselves, we are being called by God to see the bigger picture beyond the, the personal challenges, like Habakkuk, uh, who, who had to rejoice in the Lord and we had to find his strength in God, even though there were no sheep in the pen and even though the fields did not produce food. Because the only way you can do that is if you see the bigger picture. Uh, because it does not mean that COVID-19 does not affect us. It affects us just as it affects other people. But the people of God, within the house of God, have got to be seeing the bigger picture. Now, to see correctly, we therefore have to break free from a what I call a humanistic gospel. Um, uh, and, and the church can be bound by this humanistic gospel, which is really the gospel of the snake in Genesis chapter 3. The snake repositioned the command of God from the need to obey God uh, to the need to fulfill man's desire. So he, he positioned the fruit that we're not supposed to touch. And he said, just Eve to eat of this fruit. And, and that is what constitutes a humanistic gospel. It is basically bound by the imperative of human well-being. So in other words, we are talking here about things having to be good and, and um, we cannot see God outside of our own well-being. And that is what I, I refer to as a humanistic gospel. So to see correctly, we must break free from a humanistic gospel to an eternal gospel of the kingdom of God. Maybe 24 verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations. In Revelation 14, verse 6, this angel is flying around declaring the eternal gospel of God. So we have to move from a humanistic gospel to this eternal gospel of the kingdom of God, which is focused at moving humanity from rebellion towards liberation from sin. The thing that God wants to do in humanity is to move us away from rebellion or to move the nations of the earth, as it were, away from rebellion to liberation from sin, liberation from unrighteousness. That is God's desire. That is God's drive. And that's what God wants to do. Now think about this. In the days of the Egyptian plagues, if we start to follow some prophetic patterns in the word of God, in the days of the Egyptian plagues, if you were part of the middle class uh, you know, in Egypt, if you were the middle class Egyptian, you saw disruption of the economy in the plagues. But from a Jewish slave point of view, this was a day of liberation. 
So a crisis at any given point in time, and we've had people talk about COVID-19 and, and what it means, and, and we've had the, those who sit in power talk about COVID-19 and what it means for the poor. Actually, people have to be able to stand and define for themselves what this pandemic means inside of this. And the church uh, uh, must stand up to, 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 to declare what this you know, pandemic means from a kingdom point of view. In the days of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you were part of the affluent and the powerful Pharisee order, you saw disruption in Jesus. He, was, he represented disruption to the establishment of the day. But as an, as an ordinary Gentile, this was a day of liberation and inclusion. The day of Jesus dying on the cross was actually the day of liberation and inclusion. So very interesting contradictions um, that happen in the word of God, depending on, on, on where you stand. And now the people, we, we the church, as a vineyard movement, as the church of God, as the body of Christ, had to be able to, re to be representing the Lord in the midst of it all and, and be that confluence of nations and of classes and people groups and cultures as we declare what this means from a kingdom point of view. And if we follow the pattern again in the word of God, we see that in, for instance, in the vision of Daniel chapter 2, which was first seen by the king of the Babylonians and then was interpreted by Daniel, it shows us that disruption of an established human order creates the context for the kingdom of God to advance in the earth. Disruption of an established human order actually creates a context for the kingdom of God to advance. We see this relationship between the rock and the human statue. The rock strikes the human statue. And that's what we see. Uh, just as if we to look at other characters in the word of God, Joseph came out of broken family and slave trade. Daniel was a victim of war. Jesus was crucified by a corrupt political system. There is always in the word of God, this relationship between crisis and purpose. And, and uh, it's, it's very, very important. That's why it's so important to lift up our eyes um, uh, uh, from this humanistic gospel, to begin to see the gospel of the kingdom of God, to see how crisis triggers purpose. Crisis tends to uh, trigger, uh, you, know, you know, purpose. We then can ask the question, what is happening? And and what I felt God lay inside of my heart is in two words, the words new ecology. What is happening is that God is establishing a new ecology for his kingdom. He is establishing a new ecology for the kingdom of God. That's what is happening um, inside of this season, inside of this time. New ecology, basically, basically we know the word ecology or ecosystem, new ecology, by a new ecology, we're referring to a new environment, an environment with new opportunities for the kingdom of God. There are things about the kingdom that we now can declare because of the nature of the crisis upon mankind that we could not declare nine, 10 months ago. That's an age of crisis. Crisis tends to break the rebellion of human heart and allows man to begin to open up once again towards the righteousness of God. There are things that we could not declare in 2019 that we now can declare and nations will listen. Peoples from different cultures and different regions will pay attention simply because of what is going on at this point in time. That's very, very crucial for us to be able to see. And I think that a world of, uh, you know, a world, a post COVID-19 world will really be characterized by this sense of loss. People have lost their loved ones. People are losing businesses, the sense of loss. There will be the sense of futility and mean, meaninglessness as people begin to process all that they've built and how that which they built has vanished within a day, as the prophetic scriptures would say. Um, the post-COVID-19 uh, world will be characterized by fear and vulnerability, a sense of life not being predictable, because we have seen that our public healthcare systems, even in the stronger economies in Europe, are not as strong as we thought. And so there's a sense of fear, there's a sense of vulnerability. There will be greater tension on issues of inequality and injustice, greater tension on issues 
of inequality and injustice. We've seen protests because all of the stuff that has happened, even around racism, all of that is really part of COVID-19. And that's why I say COVID-19 is a systemic pandemic um, that represents a whole variety of issues. So there will be great attention on issues of inequality and injustice because we have seen what injustice and inequality can do, right? Inside of South Africa, we are wrestling with our public you know, education system and, and uh, the inequality within our education system. And so there's gonna be great attention around these things. And humans will be living to survive, which is obviously a dangerous thing. When, when we, 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 we launch that human survival you know, orientation in humankind, it's a dangerous thing, but that's the reality. As everybody's gonna be trying to uh, resuscitate themselves back to normality. And there's gonna be a sense of human survival. Inside of that, we, the church, have to be the opportunity or have to see the opportunity to proclaim hope and to proclaim righteousness. Because that's the solution to this, hope and righteousness. And not only must we proclaim hope and righteousness, we must be hope and righteousness. In other words, if there is a sense of loss out there, there has to be a sense of hope in the house of God. If there is a, a, a sense of inequality and injustice out there, there has to be a sense of rightness and righteousness and justice within the house of God. If there's a sense of fear and vulnerability out there, there has to be a sense of community and love within the house of God. So we have to be the agency of hope and of righteousness. People must look at, when they look at us, they must see, when people look at us, they must see hope and they must see righteousness. It's not about what we have to say, it is about the construct. It is about our ability to incarnate Christ as a collective community, as this ecclesia of God in the midst of a broken world. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, um, uh, it says here that by the, by the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We know the suddenness of COVID-19. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. I'm not talking about the ultimate coming of the Lord. And we know, we know the scripture is ultimate as it is progressive. And so we can apply these things in our current context. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in verse 10, in 2 Peter chapter 3. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people, what kind of church, what kind of vineyard South Africa, what kind of vineyard movement, what kind of body of Christ ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and spirits coming. Now, in verse 11, it's very, very important because that's an apostolic scripture that talks to us about our need to, to have a response, a counter response in the day of crisis. If we're going to be living in a day of suddenness, of loss of life, of destruction, what kind of people, the question is being asked. What kind of people must Venus South Africa become? What kind of people must the body of Christ become? And then it says in verse 12, as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. Speed is coming means we facilitate the coming of the purpose of God. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth the home of righteousness. Amazing scripture, I think, uh, that applies in, in our context uh, in terms of where we find ourselves. I want to bring to your attention three words here. The, 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 the first words, you know, the phrase talks about the disappearance of the heavens. And I think that speaks about the whole process of extinction. Um, uh, COVID-19 is facilitating an extinction of some kind. Extinction in, in terms of ideas, in terms of ideologies, in terms of theories, in terms of ways of life, in terms of even theological positions and even industries. Uh, that things that have um, um, gone extinct because of COVID-19, things that were here, and 2 Peter chapter 3 is, is a prophetic, or gives us a prophetic framework of what happens when God arrives, when his purpose arrives in the earth. The first thing that happens is a disappearance, a process of extinction, extinction of ideas that people held about 
business, about community, about family, about doing, you know, running governments or all sorts of things, or even doing church. Extension of ideas, extension of ideologies, of theories, of ways of life, of theological positions and industries even. Industries have been wiped out as a result of COVID-19. And, and so the business landscape is gonna be very, very different in a post-COVID world. The second word I wanna to bring to your uh, attention is the word destruction. So not only is there a disappearance or extinction, there's also a destruction that we are told about in 2 Peter chapter three. And that word destruction means to unravel. It talks about things unraveling or disintegrating. And I say, this is exactly what we have seen inside of COVID-19, is that life has been unraveling. The systems that man has built are unraveling. Our economies, the way we have constructed our economies, the way we have maybe built families. Now, if you think about it, inside of the pandemic and the lockdown, the one institution that we have required to be functional is the institution of family. Now, in a, in a post-COVID-19 world, it is for the church, therefore, to go to the governments and to, to tell them that it is actually in your interest to, 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 to promote laws and policies that protect the, the sanctity of family, because you cannot do lockdown without a family. And it, it, one of the African countries actually could not do a lockdown because of homelessness. And the issue was, we cannot lock down because if we lock down, where are people going to go? And so the post COVID-19 world, the prophetic response to that from the church is that actually family is a fundamental basic institution of society. It is in the interest of governments to promote laws and, and, and policies that uphold the, the, and that protect the sanctity of family. And we know some of the laws that, have, that are going around in this uh, liberal democratic uh, dispensational age in which we find ourselves. The next word that I want to you know, bring to your attention is the word newness, which I think is a great word. After this disappearance and disruption, we're actually moving towards newness. And newness is linked in verse 13 in 2 Peter chapter 3. Newness is linked to the whole issue of establishing a home of righteousness. I want to submit to you, Venus South Africa. I want to submit you know, to us as the body of Christ that actually life in post-COVID-19 will have to see a church that will emerge, that will arise to really establish what we call a household of righteousness. And when I say a household, I mean, I mean a, an arrangement of life, um, a, a space of life that promotes righteousness. And that and, and, and family is one of the examples that we see as nations in a struggle with gender-based violence, not only in South Africa. We've had reports of gender-based violence in South America and different parts of the world uh, because the institution, institution of family has been challenged under the, the lockdown. That is to the advantage of the church to begin to blow its horn and sound its prophetic alarm to the nations to say, actually, family is a very, very important institution in society. So disappearance, destruction, we now have to conceptualize newness. The, a new home of righteousness has to be established in post-COVID-19. If we have to talk about new ecology, uh, the, 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 the other, you know, um, um, uh, story that we can think about, the other, uh, story that we can use as a parable, as a prophetic parable that we can think about, you know, in the word of God that captures, that brings interpretation to what we are going through is the whole story of the establishment of Antioch in Acts 11, verses 19 to 24. That movement from Jerusalem to Antioch, I think is very, very important for, for us in terms of where we are. Now, in, in Acts 11, Acts 11, verses 19 to 24, it says this. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The, Lord, the Lord's hand was with them, 
and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. In verse 22, news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. I think there's something prophetically significant for us in this story inside of where we find ourselves. If you think about Jerusalem, Jerusalem represented a, centrali a centralistic, exclusive, and homogeneous church that failed to live up to the full mandate of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jerusalem represented a centralistic, exclusive, and homogeneous church that failed to live up to the full mandate of the Great Commission. Antioch, on the other hand, represented an inclusive and diverse church with strong leadership and functional saints, a church that became a distribution center of doctrine and of kingdom life. I think that's where we want to find ourselves. So Jerusalem, on the one hand, represented a centralistic, you know, it was centralized, it was exclusive culturally, and it was obviously homogeneous, a homogeneous church that failed to live up to the full mandate of May the 28th. And when I say homogeneous, I don't mean there weren't other cultures, but what I mean was there was a dominant culture that was hosting, there was a host culture that hosted everything that happened, and that was obviously the Jewish culture. We know the story of Acts chapter 6. In Antioch, on the other hand, Antioch represented an inclusive and diverse church with strong leadership and functional saints, a church that became a distribution center of doctrine and of kingdom life. That's where we want to find ourselves. We want to find ourselves as distribution centers of doctrine and of kingdom life. Now, Jerusalem had to resolve a couple of issues. Jerusalem had to resolve the conflict between their pulpit message and their life at the table. We know that they were given a message by the Lord, the message of the gospel of the kingdom, which was a message of reconciliation, and yet at the table there was discrimination in Acts chapter 6. They had to resolve that. They had to resolve the conflict between presenting a racialized Jewish God to the Gentiles instead of the God of the nations. We know the story of Acts chapter 15 where they said, unless you're circumcised like us, you cannot be saved. What they were doing is they were racializing Jesus. They were bringing to, uh, to, to the nations of the earth a Jewish God when they were in fact supposed to be bringing the God of the nations. The other conflict they had to resolve was this conflict between their cultural preference and doctrinal imperatives. I think that Church has to arrive at this place of maturity where we distinguish between what we prefer culturally and what is imperative doctrinally. In Acts 15, again, the whole issue of circumcision, of physical circumcision, was a mere cultural preference. Uh, something that said you need to look like us in order to be saved. And yet, so their problem was they confused culture with theology. They confuse theology with culture. They mix the two. And I think it's time for the church to unravel, to, 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 to separate between cultural preferences and doctrinal imperatives. The other thing that they had to resolve was this whole issue of maintaining an old covenant identity in a new covenant world. They were a Jewish people and, and they were still functioning according to the mindset of the old covenant but the problem is that they were functioning within a new covenant world. We have to begin to see, therefore, church, the environment that the Lord is bringing us into and make sure that we cut the umbilical cord between us and the systems of life, the, the, the wombs that have carried us in the former seasons, but that cannot be able to facilitate life in the new season. That, that in fact, like a baby, if the baby remains connected to its to, to, to his mom, to his mom after you know birth, actually 
the baby can can potentially die, including the, the mom as well. You know, you got to cut that umbilical cord to begin to you know step into a new mechanism of life where the baby can begin to use her mouth to be able to eat. So we've got to be able to cut the umbilical cord uh, between us and the former environment so that we are stepping into the new with a new identity that God is going to afford, a new name that God, Isaiah chapter 62, a new name that God has to give to us. And of course, therefore, if we look at Antioch, the background is one in which the church in Jerusalem is bound by, you know, uh, by a familiar and a homogeneous environment. And, and the, the question, and so they were bound in Jerusalem by a familiar environment, by this homogeneous environment. They become comfortable in what they, were, in what they knew. The question for us today in 2020, as we process life post COVID-19 is, in what way is our current environment inhibiting kingdom advance? It is for us as leaders and as saints to sit down and to quantify things that need to be identified and that are no longer good for us um, uh, uh, to, to, to move forward. We are in the process of, of, of moving here as a family and I've been looking at my books and CDs and, and the, there were resources that were very good for me uh, in the primitive days of my salvation, but I cannot take to, 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 uh, to a new place with me. Uh, I've got to be able to let go, but it can be a struggle to let go of that which used to be valuable to you. But that is, 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 has, has become obsolete, to use the language of Hebrew chapter, chapter 8, verse 13, has become obsolete in the context of where you are going. And so in what way is our current environment inhibiting kingdom advance? And for these people in Acts 11, they needed a, a, a crisis of some kind, a trigger point, which was the persecution of Stephen, in best in, in, you know, as, as we saw in Acts chapter 8. They needed that in order to step into the, the, the newness of the kingdom of God. And I think COVID-19 is that trigger point for us that we need to embrace, even though it's brought so much of difficulty and even loss of life, unfortunately. Then it says, of course, that key word scattered, they were scattered. They were scattered because of the persecution in verse 19. That word scattered, actually, when you read, when you read about, when you read it from our English Bibles, it, 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 it captures the idea of crisis. But actually, when you look at the, the Greek meaning of the word, it means to scatter seeds. And so God really was scattering them. He was planting seeds all over. He was taking them out of their comfort zone, zone in Jerusalem and was spreading them out. He was opening them up and he was sending them out into the other regions. That's really what was happening. Um, and, and so we know that the death of Stephen was actually in his moment of death, he saw the Lordship of Christ. And so it was, it happened under full view of God's sovereignty. And, and so every detail was counted for under God's sovereignty. And because God was really facilitating something greater, the scattering, the, the, the spreading, the, the, the planting of the seeds into the other regions beyond, beyond uh, the, the, the area of comfort. Now, that is very important when we think about the whole idea of planting, of planting a tree, that God wants to plant trees of righteousness in our communities, in cities, in neighborhoods, in villages. And in Isaiah 61, verse 3, it talks about oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. We, that's who we are. We are the oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor in Isaiah 61, verse 3. And I love the analogy of the tree. It's a powerful analogy because the, the tree basically has to be understood in two ways. The tree has, has input factors. So in the sense that the tree must be able to draw water through its root system and must be able to uh, uh, draw light energy through its leaves. And, and both water and light can be understood in our context as church to represent the word of God. So if we are going to be these oaks of righteousness, healthy trees in the midst of our neighborhoods, of our cities and villages, we've got to be able to draw from the word of God, his water 
the word that is water and the word that is light to us. The tree must have leaves that are able to convert light energy into life. So it eats through its leaves. And that's very, very important. The other, the second component that's very important about a tree is its output mechanism. The tree is of no use if it's not bringing utility to its environment. The tree is of no use if it's not bringing utility to its environment. And the tree brings utility to its environment in three ways. It must bring number one shade. It must bring shade. And, and I think that speaks of relief, the ministry of relief and comfort. We as church are going to have to do a lot of relief and comfort post COVID-19. The tree must bring shade to its environment. That's the first thing that a tree must do. But the second utility of the tree is that it brings healing through, through, healing through its leaves. So the, 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 the tree has medicinal effect to its environment. And, and, and I think that speaks of uh, you know, the ministry of, of, of healing from the church, physical and psychological healing. There's going to be physical and psychological healing that we're going to require to, to engage in post COVID 19. The third utility of the tree, in terms of in its you know, output, output mechanism, is that the tree brings nutrition. It brings food, it supplies food to its environment through its fruits. And, and that speaks of the supply of knowledge. Uh, church has to begin to uh, uh, step into uh, uh, you know, new ways of distributing the knowledge of the Lord. Like the prophet says, that the knowledge of the glory of God shall cover the earth as waters cover the sea. Um, and that's what church has, has to be able to do through evangelism, through you know, advocacy, through teaching, through other ways and forms of ministry, not only through uh, uh, traditional limited forms of ministry, but also through, uh, you know, we've got to be stepping, for instance, more powerful in the areas of advocacy, was really Hebrew prophets were advocates of righteousness. That's what they were. They were advocating for the kingdom of God. They were advocating for justice and for righteousness. And that's what the church will have to be able to do. So the output mechanism of the tree is that it provides shade, which is a relief, relief and, and comfort uh, ministry. It provides um, 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 uh, healing through its leaves, which speaks of our uh, ministry of healing, physical and psychological. We have to speak hope to people and that's psychological you know, healing. And, and also the tree must provide food of grace. And that's where we want to find ourselves. Now, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, how do we move from the persecution of Stephen in Acts 8 to, uh, to the outcome of grace in Acts 11? That's what we need to discover prophetically and follow as we follow the Lord. If we look and are caught up in this persecution of Stephen and uh, are simply just caught up in that, in that sadness, in that crisis, we are not going to be able to find our way to that place of grace. There is a place called the evidence of grace, even in the midst of this COVID-19. There is a place called the evidence of grace. And that's where we want to find ourselves inside of our journey. That's where we want to find ourselves. So the new ecology brings questions, therefore, to us. It brings question of, questions of existence, of survival, and of newness. When, when, when the ecosystem is changing, there are three things that you have to be thinking about, existence, survival, and newness. The question of existence is a question of purpose, vineyard. It's a question of purpose. Why do we have vineyard South Africa? What's the purpose of vineyard South Africa? Uh, what's the burning platform for Venus South Africa? What is the what is the purpose? What is it that if Venus South Africa was not here would not happen? In other words, that's what we need to be able to ask ourselves. That existential question. The second question we have to ask ourselves: the question of survival, the the offloading of unnecessary baggage and and the cutting off of of of, of excessive fat, as we see in the story of Paul. Uh, sailing in the ship uh, uh, to Rome and how they had to offload, offload the cargo in order to save their lives. This is the time to offload uh, the, the cargo in order to save our, our lives in the midst of, of the crisis so that we can make it. It's time to cut off the 
excessive fat and it's time to, to, to offload the unnecessary baggage. It's time to be light in the things of God. It's time to be like, to move like a, a speed boat, to, a boat, to be able to, to make swift decisions and swift movements in the things of God, like we see in Acts chapter 11. There was no time in Acts chapter 11 for them to go back to the council in Jerusalem to find permission to, to speak to Greeks. It was time and there was movement of the Spirit of God and their conviction was being overwhelmed by, their hearts were being overwhelmed by the conviction of the Spirit. They began to speak. And, and so we need to be able to, to offload and to be light so that we can move swiftly. The third question inside of a new ecology is a question of newness. Once you process existence and survival, then you need to be stepping into newness. And the way you step into newness, uh, 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 Venus, South Africa, is by the process of metamorphosis, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And metamorphosis cannot be invented by, by good ideas. Metamorphosis requires us to see the Lord the revelation of Christ triggers transformation. As we behold him, as we gaze at him, we begin to transform, we begin to metamorphose, we change. That word transform there literally means to change from one condition to another. And that's what we want to be able to see happening inside of uh, this time. Existence, survival, and newness. I want to I wanna seal this by just this um, uh, five principles that must guide our areas, our mission, our missional focus inside of a post-COVID-19 world. Now, if you think about um, God's act of creation, God creating Adam, and we know that Christ came as the last Adam, and so Christ comes to re-establish God's creation order, which means in Christ we start the process all over again. Christ is the new is, a, is the first human of the new human race of the new creation. If a man is in Christ, he is a new creation. We know the scripture. We have to process inside of a post COVID nineteen world um, uh, how we need to function in our missional focus, in our apostolic mission, as we as we as we release the kingdom of God upon and as we bless the nations with the kingdom of God. When we look at what God created, that gives us clues about our areas of missional focus. Now, God in the beginning created a human being in devotion to God, living with fellow humans within a space of life and under the government of God. God created a human being in devotion to God. The human was worshiping God, living with fellow humans within a space of life and under the government of God. And this is where I think this takes us. And this is my last slide here, Vinian. Is that what God created must give us clues about how we need to launch in our apostolic mission, I think, in this post-COVID world. God created a human being who lived in a state of devotion to God. And what that means in terms of our apostolic mission is that we had to continue to call people, to call upon people to give their hearts and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to launch even deeper into evangelism. Evangelism is going to be key in a post-COVID-19 world, calling people to a place of devotion to God. The second thing that God created, you know, the second component in God's creation is the human, the whole aspect of humanity. And I think that tells us, uh, church, that we must advocate and we must represent a humanity that is not a construct of ethnicity and worldliness, but one that is the incarnation of the image of God a humanity that is the incarnation of the image of God. We've got to quantify the image of God in the form of human values and take that as a definition of what it means to be human. I cannot be defined in my, in my humanity by the culture I come from or by the color of my skin. The image of God is God to, is God to define us. And when the image of God defines us, we're gonna find must moving into a place of common humanity. The third component in the creation of God is that the human lived with fellow humans. 
And I think that in our missional focus speaks about the fact that we must rediscover the conviction, the theology, and the passion of the gospel of reconciliation. Let's remember that the gospel of reconciliation was, a, was central in the message of the early church. It was not a, a political thing that was seen uh, to be a thing that you, uh, there was an optional extra that you did from time to time. It was central to Paul's message across the cities and across the nations. We must rediscover the conviction, the theology, the passion of the gospel of reconciliation because Adam lived with Eve. That's how, with what God created. The fourth component of what God created is the space of life and how God put the man in the garden. He put the man within a space. And that tells us that we must advance the transformation of spaces of life. And these are spaces of families, of cities, of business, of nations. We must advocate for the transformation of spaces of life in order to improve the human condition and to establish spatial righteousness and justice. Now, we as Christians can be used to worshiping God on Sunday and going to an unrighteous space on Monday in the context of our workplace, or worshiping God on Sunday and, and living in an unrighteous space in the context of the laws of our nation, like we have seen in South Africa with apartheid. We've got to reconcile the two and break that conflict within our own lives. And the way we do that is to begin to be like Adam, to, to take care of our garden, to take care of our spaces of life, and to call for the transformation of spaces. We cannot evangelize humans without speaking into the spaces in which these humans live. That's very, very important. The people who are speaking to are not just people that live on Sunday morning in our, in our auditoriums, but these people have to go back into spaces of life. It is in the interest of the church to speak for the transformation of the spaces of life. The last thing that we have to incorporate in our missional focus is the whole idea of the government of God, that we must call humanity to submit under the righteous commands of the Lord to, so that humanity can experience shalom. What is shalom? Shalom is peace. Shalom is well-being. Shalom is security. Shalom is prosperity. There's not, a, there's not a single nation state that is not looking for peace, for well-being, for security, for prosperity. There's not a single intelligence agency that is not trying to uh, promote peace, well-being, security, and prosperity for its own nation state. It is therefore in the interest of the nations that they begin to line themselves up with the righteous commands of the Lord. Devotion to God means evangelism. Humanity means we've got to represent a construct of humanity um, that is the incarnation of the image of God. Living with fellow human beings means the gospel of reconciliation has to come back to the center of, of the message of the church. Spaces of life means we are not just speaking to humans on Sunday, but we're also addressing the spaces in which these humans exist. The government of God means that the nations of the earth must be called to live under the righteous commands of God. This is what I feel Vineyard Church, Vineyard South Africa, is, is what God has laid inside of my own heart for you. And, and, and I believe that as the word of God has been proclaimed that you're, you're feeling the, 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 the light of God is exploding within your own heart and, and, and the pulsations of the spirit of God. And, and there's, a, there's a moment of bathing uh, inside of this time, a bathing of a new baby um, um, uh, so that we can discard the, 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 the womb and, and begin to look into this new thing that God is doing. I want to pray for us and then I'm going to hand over back to Dave. Father God, we want to thank you this morning. We want to bless your name for Vineyard South Africa. We thank you for the journey. We thank you for what this church represents. We thank you for what this part of the body of Christ represents. We thank you for the stages of the journey of this church. We know that Moses Lord began to count and began to record the stages of the journey of the people of Israel. He began to quantify the different seasons. I pray God that the, the leadership of Vina South Africa will come to a moment of quantifying the different stages and seasons of 
this movement of this church. So that, oh God, they, be, they can begin to see the mountain upon which they now stand, from which they look into the promised land. They begin to quantify their current place, their current placement, oh God, to be able to have a view of what God you are calling them to. Father God, I pray for the spirit of Antioch to fall upon the vineyard you know, movement. That, oh God, there will be the, 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 the suddenness of the move of the spirit of God, not only upon leaders, but God also upon the saints. That there will be the power to proclaim the gospel to diversified environments, oh God. That, oh God, there will not ju just be a people who are only able to speak to one people group, but Father, that they'll be able to speak to a variety of people groups like Paul, like Antioch, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that they'll be able to speak to the Jews um, and, and to those who don't live under the law, Father, and be able to articulate, like Paul said to the Corinthians, be able to articulate with skill the wisdom, the message of the Lord. I pray, God, that this will be a moment to offload, and this will be a moment to cut off the umbilical cord. God, I feel that there's a need and that there's a stage, there's a moment uh, for this church, for you, Vineyard South Africa, to begin to cut off the umbilical cord, to begin to see and to begin to consider those things that have been valuable in the past seasons, but that can no longer take you into the future. To, 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 to thank God for them, to honor God for them, but to still cut that umbilical cord and to begin to trust that God will begin to supply you with milk and that you will move from being an old man to become a child once again, that you can give away your maturity of the former season to step into newness, to step into that childlikeness of the spirit in the new season and trust God to supply you with milk, trust God to supply you with meat as you grow in the new season, that you'll become, uh, like Paul says to the Ephesians, a mature man, a mature man uh, that is moving into the fullness of Christ. And that, yes, we may begin to record, the Spirit of God will record your former seasons in the chronicles of heaven, but the Lord is beginning to open it up uh, new scrolls, new scrolls and scrolls, and there's an opportunity for you to begin to write a new story, to begin to record a new chronicle, to begin to write like it was in the book of Acts, to begin to uh, have a new encounter with God, and that God uh, may bestow on you a new name that you may be called by a new name in the land. And that not only will God call you by a new name, but the nations of the earth will call you Binat by a new name. That there will be a new identity that the Lord will begin to um, cause to form and to arise within your own spirit. That, that there will be a formation of the baby Jesus Christ within you. And that that baby will grow like it, the baby grew in the book of Luke chapter 2. A baby will grow and that baby will become mature. And so Paul calls the Galatians uh, to a place of formation of Christ. And he says, I'm praying for you, Galatians. I'm praying for you, Venus, South Africa, that Christ may be formed in your hearts once again. And that word formation means the carving of, of the image of Christ, that God uh, in his artistic skill will begin to carve within the heart of the leadership of this church, will begin to carve within the churches of Venus, South Africa, something of Christ and something that is otherworldly, something that comes from heaven that will begin to form within you and that will move into your new inheritance. There's an inheritance. There's an inheritance in Ephesians chapter 1. There's an inheritance of wisdom, of revelation. There's an inheritance with the saints. There's an inheritance. There's a place for you in the body of Christ. But you've been called to give away that which is your mature record to step into a place of vulnerability and trust God. We thank you, Father. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Dave. And thanks, Vina, South Africa. It was great to speak to you. And let's, I think God has some great things ahead of you. And let's trust God is going to move. And God is good in the midst of the crisis. The goodness of God will prevail. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. We appreciate that word. And just looking at some of the messages coming in, people have been delighting in that. It's been such a stimulating thing for us. 
and uh, the picture you've painted for us, the call you've, you've issued towards us to move forward in God. Uh, though there might be giants in that land that lies ahead, and as one brother pointed out in Numbers 14, verse 9, uh, Joshua and Caleb say, we will eat them, they'll be our bread. So we have a confidence in Christ to take hold of this new land, to live this new ecology, as you, as you call it. So thank you for that wonderful word. We appreciate that. It stimulates, it challenges us, it calls us forth. And uh, we can't be the same. We can't see Jesus and then walk like the old man. We thank you, Lord, for the call you've given us to be this new humanity. And thank you to all of you, both here at Fountain and uh, especially all over the, the, the country for your patience with our technical glitches, power dips here in the Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, whatever. So we, uh, we've learned a lot of things this morning on the technical side, and we hope to have it all sorted out by the time we hit the conference in five weeks' time. So just to remind you, the 1st to the 4th of October uh, is our conference. It'll be online, and the platform will be... Uh, announce as well and there's a, a link up for you to sign in if you sign in the advantage of that is that you get direct correspondence and, and uh, notices concerning the the conference it won't all just go through your church office so if you sign up the um the google form that'll help us to be connecting directly with you but there's been a lot of people li linking in today and if any of you who have been linking in uh would like to talk further pray further receive ministry wonderful having guys like andrew Andrew Christie and Andy van der Bale, uh, Johan Fullard, I think Ariane's involved. There's a whole team of people standing by to, uh, 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 to engage in a, a Zoom link. So that's been posted on the, uh, on the social media. You can pick up the link and you can go straight into that room, the Zoom room, and there'll be breakaway opportunities for personal ministry as well. So no one needs to be confused or abandoned. If something has challenged you, something has has uh, sparked something for you that you need to talk this through, pray through, receive ministry, just have someone pray with you, wherever you are, wherever you are, go to that, uh, that link that's been posted and uh, they'll take time to pray with you. Uh, you might even find Robert himself, links in there if you want to engage with him directly. Andrew could, could share that and, and help facilitate that. If you have any questions to Robert, you should be able to go on that same link and you can Zoom with him as well. So it's nice to have... Ray with me here and the team that's been helping us here at Fountain, the worship, um, and we, we're looking forward to what God's going to ongoingly do in our lives and in this movement in South Africa. We're so grateful for the, the shoulders of those that have gone before us and whom we can stand and, uh, and move forward. Um, and uh, we, we're very grateful for the foundations God has laid, but as we've been called this morning, God says and reminds us, I make all things new. He's leading us in fresh ways, and we're anticipating a, a wonderful breakthrough of God. And we want as a vineyard movement to be part of that reaping, part of that engaging uh, in, this, in this next season that God is bringing to the world. And let's, let's do that right here in South Africa, wherever God would lead us to have influence and ministry. So Lord, we thank you as we close this time in prayer. We thank you again for the richness of the gospel of grace and truth that came by Jesus. Father, thank you for the call that's on our lives as men and women, boys and girls, who said yes to Jesus. Thank you for the call that comes to us then to walk in this new humanity and to embrace that which will be salt and light to a hurting, confused world, especially in a world caught with COVID and looking towards post-COVID. And all the challenges that lie before us, Lord, we thank you that with you we are overcomers, that with you we can anticipate victory. Thank you that with you we can anticipate seasons of great fruitfulness beyond, uh, beyond our, our greatest expectations. And Lord, thank you that you are wanting to do deep and powerful things in us. But most of all, thank you for the, the joy of walking in, in, in abandon in your presence, abandoning ourselves to you, embracing your presence. Thank you that you go with us, like, as Joshua and, and Caleb said, that you are with us. You walk with us. You will not leave us. Their protection is gone, but ours is in you. So thank you, Lord, for these things. And thank you for the vineyard of South Africa and the things you're calling us to. Thank you for the people you're causing us to become. And thank you for the amazing gift 
of grace and unity we're experiencing between us. And thank you for the, the, the capacity to talk things out and to collaborate and to together come before you and to say yes to your call that's on us for the road ahead. So we say, Lord, you've been good to us. You are good to us and you will be. And we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for listening today.